Hi, I am uh, Shankar. I am the founder and CEO of Plum, uh, PlumWoodness.com. Uh, we are a health, uh, we are a beauty and personal care brand, and uh, we started about a decade ago, and we are India's first uh, 100% vegan beauty brand. So, uh, Shankar, could you give me like a elevator pitch for Plum? Uh, you know, wh why why does Plum matter? Wh why should our listeners care about Plum? Right, so this is something I solved for right, I, right when I was uh, in the design phase. And uh, one of the questions that I read in this book called The Art of the Start by uh, Kai Kawasaki was, why, does, why, does, why, is your, why is your world the better place when your brand is around? Or no, why, is it, why is it the worse off place when your brand is not around? Kind of question. So I think uh, the answer that we put down then, thankfully, is still the answer that is uh, even after 10 years, the same answer that uh, we aim to add goodness to this world through our product, uh, products, brand, and through our thoughts and actions. Uh, personal care, beauty, cosmetics, this is almost incidental to why we exist. The, the reason the brand exists is to add goodness to this world. And that's why uh, Plum Goodness is something that uh, is the second name of this brand. Uh, so that's really the elevator pitch so uh, just add more good to the world everybody knows what good is evil is so just add more good to the world so um you know i'm going to play a little bit of the devil's advocate here uh, i'm sure you've right. heard of we work right and when we work right. took out its ipo uh, it, it was generally lambasted for having a lot of uh, feel good terms in it uh, without real mm -hmm. numbers and uh, yeah. so you know Add goodness to the world is, yes, feel good, but uh, it's very vague. Yeah. And I'm okay with it being vague. I get challenged on this a lot. So many brands talk about goodness. Uh, you know, you're not the first person to talk about it and so on and so forth. But I just believe it's one thing to talk about it. It's one thing to live it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I can't talk about living it. Those who experience it understand that we live it. And it's not but just I the products I'm talking about here. Yeah, g give me some examples of how, how you're living it. So, for example, uh, when we began, we were India's first brand to say that we will give 1% of our sales to the environment. And at that time, nobody knew of this movement okay. called 1% for the planet. When we began, we said that we will not do a fairness cream. And mind you, this was in 2014. Uh, when the market was only fairness cream, I remember having extended debates uh, with mm. my friends at the time saying you can never enter the skincare industry without having a fairness cream. And uh, we went on record to say that we will not be making a fairness cream and you see where the, where the world is now. Uh, customer delight remains our number one value. Again, one can debate that it is motherhood and apple pie, but at the end of the day, if it is, if uh, if the so if the doing is the talking, then I dare say that we do a lot more than we talk on that front. In fact, the one minute break that you gave me before we started this podcast, I was actually responding to a customer complaint that got escalated. Me, I was responding. Uh, right. And I was making sure that it is being responded to, uh, even though we have a dedicated customer delight team and so on and so forth. But we make sure that we don't, um, you know, let things lie uh, unattended or, you know, just because you've grown to a certain scale, uh, think that uh, the single customer is beyond that. So I think that ethos uh, sort of permeates through the, the workplace here. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, give me some numbers about Plum. What, what uh, how much will you do revenue-wise by the end of current year, you, you, as per your estimation? Uh, Beginning to sound but... like a board meeting already, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think okay. So let me talk in terms of uh, run rate because that's more fashionable for startups to do. Um, we should be at a 400 CR. We are already at a 400 CR run rate. We should be at a for the full year at the 400 CR number or very close to it as well, if all goes well. Um, and I think to me, you know, the potential of this brand is much, much more than that. Um, and uh, neither are we in a hurry to say, you know, I get to this number based on so date. And yeah, sure, we have those targets and we have those board meetings to look at those targets. But for me, right now, this journey is about building the brand, taking people along with it. And when I say people, I mean consumers along with it on this journey. And uh, given the kind of market that we operate in, which is India, which is one and a half billion people, our vision is to touch a billion lives every day. And maybe we'll get there in four years, 10 years, 20 years. 
you'll get tens. Wow, amazing! And uh, what kind of uh, fundraise have you done till date? So we've had three. We have first of all we bootstrapped for five years. So when we began in twenty thirteen, wow. uh, uh, it was uh, till late twenty eighteen, uh, which is about five years back. Is uh, we bootstrapped and we were profitable in twenty sixteen itself. We were quite wow. small, but we were probably bootstrapped. And I still bore my team with those stories every day. Uh, and we raised our first round of money in uh, in 2018. That was from Unilever Ventures, very small round. Back then it was headlines, but now in today's day and age, it is uh, probably a less than an angel round. And then uh, we raised our Series B in the height of COVID, which was uh, late 2020. Uh, and the last round came sometime early last year, around April 2022. And that is from A91. So this Unilever Ventures Series A, Fairing Capital Series B, and uh, A91 part of the Series C. And uh, I think more than $50 million in total across these rounds. No, less than that. I think, uh, yeah, I think just less than that. Yeah, you can say approximately that. Yeah. Approximately $50 million. Okay, okay. Um, uh, tell me about the journey. Like, so, you know, you, you bootstrapped for five years. Uh, what was uh, what was it that led to the birth of Plug? First, tell me about that, and then tell me about that five-year bootstrapping journey. Uh, what were you doing before you decided to start Plug? What you know, there's this concept of founder mark, mark uh, founder market fit. Uh, what was your founder market fit? Why why are you the right founder for Plug? Right. Well, I uh, I'll go back go back in time and go back into the last century almost. That's when I graduated from college. Uh, coming out of IIT Bombay, I was a hardcore chemical engineer, as I used to call it. I still love chemical engineering. There's still a book here in my drawer of my favorite subject. So I was hardcore chemical engineer, and I could have chosen to get into quote unquote hardcore chemical engineering. But uh, I saw the placement brochure of uh, what at that time was Hindustan Lever, which today is not Hindustan Unilever. And uh, Hindustan. Uh, Lever had a very colorful placement brochure. There was one image in that placement brochure that caught my eye. It was the it was a photograph. Like back then, everything was hard copy. I'm talking last century. So um, there was a photograph of an ice cream production line, right? And I think I saw Cornetto or something. Rows of Cornettos coming off the line uh, in that photograph. And I said, this looks like a fun place to be. It's got a lot of color. It's got a lot of you know, energy, it's going to be a lot of uh, engineering as well to produce something like that. And of course, HUL uh, used to pay well. I think they still do. I uh, used to pay well then, and it was a day one company. And so I said, this is a place I want to get into uh, to make fun stuff like this. I had no idea what this was all about. It was just a you know, liking that I got. But I have to thank anybody who, anyone who, who had produced that uh, placement brochure for uh, HUL, I have to thank because that got me into this industry. <laughs> okay. And uh, okay. Uh, thankfully, I stuck there for eight years in, in San Lever, uh, four years in manufacturing, four years in R&D, and that really formed the foundation for a lot of things that I do. I still have a lot of respect for uh, for the organization, and in fact, I was happy to for them, I mean, the Ventures, uh, to be to be the Series A uh, investor. Um, and uh, for me, uh, being in consumer goods has always been very interesting. So I I left HU to do my MBA. Uh, from ISP, I joined McKinsey. Uh, I was there for a couple of years, but in those couple of years, did one consumer study. I sought it out. I said, I want to do one consumer study, but I just don't want to get out of the space. And uh, even when I left McKinsey to join what I called at the time the, the task of building a business, and I was agnostic to what business I was building, not as an entrepreneur, but as, as a part of the team, uh, I chose retail financial services again. I just like the consumer side of things a lot, a lot, a lot more, even when it comes to financial services compared to the wholesale side of things. Uh, and as luck would have it, the private equity fund that I was working uh, for uh, had bought a majority stake in Faces uh, Canada, which is a cosmetics brand. And that's where I learned the front end of the business. I got to operate that business for uh, close to five years. And uh, when I started- You were like the, the CEO for uh, India yeah, for yeah, Faces. Yeah. Okay. For a couple of years, yes. And then the full-time CEO joined, but I was still working very closely with them. I completely enjoyed this thing. I think 
without me knowing and i had no intentions of becoming an entrepreneur then to be very honest but without me knowing i was practicing all those uh, skills and necessary to be an entrepreneur so it sort of i started very late as an entrepreneur i was about 38 when i started out uh, wow that's inspiring so, yeah so even to me my inspiration is uh, falguni uh, she started even much later in in life falguni and i of like a right yeah absolutely i mean uh, i mean and to, to be in this industry with no background and then to build something that is as special as nike i mean i i have a lot of respect uh, for her and for what she's built hmm yeah absolutely uh, I, i want to zoom in a little bit on uh, what you took me through uh, the the pre plum journey uh, in uh, r&d at hul w- what kind of products did you develop w- was it again beauty and uh, uh, like skin care and so uh, it's tough to believe it when i tell you that i myself find it really tough to believe but back then the largest business for uh, unilever in india was soaps and detergents so most of the i would say a part of the good guys group but most of the good guys used to be in soaps and detergents back then or at least most of the guys used to be in so- soaps and detergents uh without necessarily qualifying that uh, yeah, this was when the uh, hul and nirma were like really in a tough yeah, battle yeah, yeah. for those were the days share. correct uh. absolutely and the personal products as it was called was beginning to be dominated by the likes of shampoo and stuff like india was a toothpaste so india was moving from soap household penetration is now 99% shampoo penetration was around 90% uh, or or thereabouts and india was just beginning this was the cusp of the beginning of this whole personal care revolution in this country skin care was down to fairness league largely and uh, face wash we had to convince people that face wash is better than soap otherwise people are using the same bar of soap for uh their face face also and uh, it sounds like under era but it's only 20 25 years back and uh, people were had people had to be convinced why shardels were better than so i mean we used to have brainstorm sessions on how do you get people to use shardel in this country anyway the reason i'm giving all this context is <clears throat> this is largely what used to happen and i was part of the in r&d the team that uh, worked on soap formulations uh, toilet soap okay. uh, i still remember most of the Sort of technology and and the thing about working on soap formulation is you can't do anything in the lab you have to do it either in a pilot plant because the soap processing is sort of heavy duty and uh, more importantly anything that you do has to be replicable at a very large scale almost immediately for example the project that i worked on uh, for uh, for lux toilet soap the volume at that time was almost 80000 tons per annum uh you push the button on your formulation it get replicated to i think about eight factories running two lines each at 400 tablets a minute and you get something wrong uh <laughs> uh probable stuff starts hitting the fan very quickly so <laughs> it's a very different yeah. it's a very different uh it used to be a very different game with soaps whereas uh, what we do right now in contrast is a 100 kilo batch uh with tender loving care filled into 50 ml tubes a few thousand pieces or a few tens of thousands of pieces right now um and not that that is necessarily more complex so this is necessarily less complex uh but i think the nature of the game is no different what i'm finding is many of the principles are still uh applicable in terms of being able to scale up properly in terms of doing it first time right uh solving for robustness of the formulation solving for variances in the raw material quality that we get uh in solving for people who go to manufacture it so i think all that experience even though that was 80000 tons per annum and this is a 100 kilo batch it doesn't really change much the intrinsic hmm interesting uh, coming to your private equity experience uh what did you learn when you were running faces uh, canada so you essentially were like an entrepreneur right you were taking faces from Correct. the zero to one journey in india Correct. um Correct. was it the right product for india it wasn't so uh, we thought it was before we went in what was the product uh, just for people who don't know what is faces uh okay so 
again a little bit of history if you humor me uh faces was started in the 1970s uh in canada uh, that's why it's still called faces canada here uh, and what faces was known for in canada and canada is a far more diverse society than let's say the us or the uk uh for longer and what what faces was known for is the range that they had so for example if i remember correctly they had 120 shades of eyeshadow and 100 shades of lipstick to begin with uh wow. so it was all color cosmetics lips eyes face i think they are nail also and so um faces was known for its diversity in the shade range and therefore the hypothesis was uh and 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 quality of the product so the hypothesis was they would be we would be able to bring those products to India and India was a product starved country. I'm talking 15 years back in the world of uh, makeup and color cosmetics because you had a bunch of incumbent brands and that's about it. There was no tail at all. Uh, we were literally brand number seven entering the market yeah, among the major brands. Um, so we thought that we'll be able to get those products and sell them in India. I still vividly remember a conversation I had with one of the regional managers who had just started off in places. Shankar, none of these shades will work here. And uh, I said, uh, we have hundred shades of lipstick and you're saying out of those hundred, and I'm a guy, I don't understand these nuances. Uh, so I, I, I didn't use to at least. And I came from a soap background just for this one. So we have hundred shades and you're saying not one of those hundred shades. She said, no, none of these hundred shades will work. That's when I realized that this world of makeup and color cosmetics is extremely nuanced. Extremely new. It's not as if those hundred is in the range from yellow to purple. They're all reds and pinks and browns and maroons and nudes. Within that, that hundred was not working here. And uh, so, in mean, long story short, we had to abandon the thought of bringing product from Canada to India. We had to set up local backend, local manufacturing or localized product development. Where again, I think my experience in the past helped. Uh, but to me, what I learned more in faces was, of course, beyond these uh, nuances, which I learned through shock therapy, but I also learned the front end of the business, uh, which is, which I'd never seen an NGO. I used to go on market business, but I never really sold. Um, and to, to be selling a 550 rupee product or a 450 rupee product, these are a routine rupee or a 25 rupee amount of soap, uh, is very different. To be selling in an assisted environment where there's a sales advisor who needs to be trained, who needs to be motivated, who needs to be uh, sort of coached to, to explain the product, um, uh, you know, features better uh, and to manage this entire system of high diversity of product and high inventory and whatnot. And that was the first time I, I learned all of that. And I think what, even though I was learning, I dare say I was able to contribute positively only because I brought extreme amount of what I call in, in a Hindi term, it's a Urdu term called Jazba into it, uh, which is just punk into the whole thing, they never say die. Uh, and uh, I think that the team was also new. At that time, there were not a lot of people who were experienced in the world of makeup and color cosplay. The talent pool was still uh, raw, uh, relatively speaking. And so all of us sort of just put in the best we had and tried to build whatever we could. And so it was like all in, all hands on deck, all guns firing more all the time. Uh, would you call it a success in India? Because I've not really heard of Faces as a brand, but I'm a man, so it's quite likely that's why I've not heard of it. Uh... It, de it depends on how you define success. So if success is still being in business after 16 years in a, in a dog eat dog um, competitive market, I think it is a success. Uh, if success is having a bunch of I, I don't track them anymore because ownership has changed hands many, many times. And uh, But I know that they're very much uh, alive and kicking. Uh, and, and in fact, more than that. Um, and if you define success as having a bunch of customers who swear by at least some of your products, if not many, uh, that's still a success. I don't know if, uh, you know, I, I really don't know of the scale at which they are at. Um, and keep track, as I said. But uh, the fact that they're around and the fact that they are very much in the consumer consideration set after all these years in a market which has seen a lot of people come and go uh, tells me that it is still alive and I'm happy to see that as somebody who put the first bricks on the ground uh, to build something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I feel happy every time I see 
something that was started then is still uh, mm-hmm. very much around and doing well. Also, you know, this is a debate I keep having with my team on uh, what do you define as brand success more generally. Um, and I keep asking them about brands and say, do you know if brand X or brand Y is bigger? And both are good brands, right? And they say, I don't even know the scale of these brands. But I said, do you, do you, do you recognize that they're good brands? They said, yes. This Typically, they, they do. I pick X and Y in such a way that they're good brands. So many brands. Do you know, for example, if Adidas is bigger than Nike, not from our industry? But do you even care? Do you have a point? The fact is both are great brands. The fact is both are having very relevant products to offer. The fact is both are in our consideration set when you go out to buy a pair of sneakers. I think that's that's what the world of you know branded goods is about. Um, and it's never really about scale alone because the world of branded goods is not about a winner take all. It is not a, you know, cab hailing or a food delivery kind of an ecosystem where you have two people and you select from one of the two. You typically select from a bunch of 20, 30, 200, 300. So there is this multiplicity. So that's the way I see what, that's the way I, I think about brands. Okay, interesting. So, uh, when you decided to quit private equity and start Plum, uh, did you? Uh, I mean, what kind of corpus did you start with? You must have put in your life savings into it. Uh, and how did that corpus help you get off the ground? And how did you hit profitability in two years? Um, so initially, I thought I'll raise money before I get to it uh, because I came. I mean, by default, I came from that environment, and I thought this and that, but. Uh, then as the as the day started passing, I found the doing far more interesting than talking to people about giving me money. Uh, and I therefore just got into the doing of it. Uh, from a money point of view, what I had done was, uh, you know, my provident fund or pension fund, depending on what you call it, I, I drew it down completely. And uh, I, bro- I, I sort of divided it mentally into two parts. One part is not to be touched. There's another part that needs to be sort of uh, deployed into this business and let's see where that fuel will take us. Uh, I began extremely frugal, extremely, extremely frugal. Uh, of course, did not take a salary, you know, I can't pay myself. It's a counter being is sort of ridiculous, but uh, yeah, I mean, for the first three years, more than three years, I didn't take a salary. Even when I started taking it, it was a pittance. Um, so uh, every rupee was was funneled or fueled into what I what I always maintained was building the brand. And therefore, we operated out of a, a two-room apartment for close to four years. It's only 2017 that we got an office that was a very small office, uh, which also I negotiated the rent of like crazy on. So I let go of a lot of places just because there was a 10,000 rupee monthly rental difference between where I wanted to be and where that place was. So I used to be extremely brutal about money. Not uh, not un, unfair or unreal, but very tight. That's, some, that's what I mean by brutal. And, uh, and very careful in general. Careful is a better word there. And, uh, and I had a sort of a least count in my mind. I still have that. It's just that the numbers increased. That... Uh, you know, there's a cost and benefit of worrying about spending something. Right? You worry too much about spending that amount of money, the amount, that opportunity cost of deploying that mental capacity on something more productive versus the saving itself of, let's say, the 1,000 rupees or the 10,000 rupees. So in my mind, I always have this trade-off. And therefore, what I call the least count comes in. So when I started out, the least count was 1,000 bucks. Right? Anything which costs less than 1,000 bucks, I wouldn't overthink about spending it. Anything more than 1,000, hang on, this needs thought. Uh, sounds like a small sum of money, but given the amount of money I was starting, this was important, point number one. Also, the ethos of it matters. Slowly, slowly, the 1,000 rupees became 5,000, then it became you know, 10,000, then it became a lakh. Uh, I think last year it became too much, so I've sort of dialed it down back, to, back into where I'm comfortable. How uh, much was it last year? <laughs> No, it almost became, I think, about five lakhs or so, hmm. uh, okay. which is still, I mean, for, for a company, I'd say one would argue that it is. But the, and I've always, one more theory, which uh, which I've seen, unfortunately, I've seen it in operation, but it's not fun to see it in operation, is uh, when you open one tap, a thousand taps open. 
So when you say one, let's say two lakh expense is fine, then your own mind starts saying that two lakh was okay. Therefore, by by inference, this wow. two lakhs is also okay. Wow. And when you are inferring wow. into the second two lakhs, your team is inferring a hundred other two lakhs. So you are you are looking at, you know that one lakh tap opening, ballooning into a two crore uh, gap. Amazing. So, this is like a uh, like you know a master class on how to be frugal. Uh, these principles are simply amazing. Yeah, yeah. And you know, yesterday I was I was, I was discussing this with one of our colleagues, and he gave me a beautiful example. He says uh, it's a very simple example. So he says uh, when you buy toothpaste, and the toothpaste tube is full. Right? How much toothpaste you squeeze out? And when you are down to the last. How much are you trying to actually squeeze out from the last few things remaining? And you compare the quantity you squeeze out when the tube is full versus when the tube is almost out. Chances are you're probably doing a two x when it is full, uh, but doing essentially the same thing, which is brushing your teeth. Uh, so I think that 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 to me, after all these years, was another beautiful explanation of what frugality means. Just because you have a full tube doesn't mean you squeeze out whatever you want. You squeeze out what you need. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Uh, this frugality comes from your own childhood, right? I, I believe you right. grew up in in a very, very humble childhood. Tell me a yeah. bit about that. So I grew up in Chennai, uh, and uh, you know my uh, parents were. My mom was a homemaker. My dad had an accountant's job. Very. Uh, with I mean, again, uh, a lot of the listeners may not understand the India pre nineties. What was your uh, household income? Five uh... thousand <laughs> bucks a month. Wow. And I mean, how many brothers then, or how many kids? Were... So I have one elder sister. Okay. But I mean, it's worth. Uh, I'm really now sounding like an old man. I am, but I'm beginning to realize I'm sounding like one. Uh, <laughs> back then, <laughs> back then, back then, the bus fare used to be thirty paise. Right. So that's one number I remember. I think back then we used to get a kilo of kilogram of rice for about eight rupees. Now which I think I don't know sixty rupees or something. So yet uh, it was not a lot, but it was enough to get us educated. It was enough to give us music music lessons. Uh, it was enough to uh, so you know uh, not. Not lead a life of saying I missed out on a lot of things. Of course, we were not doing international travel back then. If we're not even doing domestic travel back then, it was fairly limited in scope and frequency. But the quality of what we were getting was very high. It was again sounding like an old man. Uh, the commitment with which, for example, my teachers used to teach uh, was phenomenal. And I still remember what I learned in school. I'm able to tell my school children that this is exactly what the situation is. So I just it's imprinted in mind. It wasn't learning; it was imprinted in mind. So that frugality came from just having to uh, make the best use of what you've got. Um, and back then, India was not so much a demand-constrained economy; it was a supply-constrained economy. So, give you an example. Uh, again, in Chennai, I just very. Very funny example. Uh, milk was not in free supply, so if you want to buy milk for the family, you pre-book your month's supply. So we used to get what is called a milk card. It is a card with dates printed on it. The guy when he used to give a packet of milk, he used to punch a hole in that date. So today is whatever seventh, so punch the seventh and go. So you had to pre-pay for that for a month's supply of milk. Uh, and then go in the morning to that milk booth, get that card punched, and get your milk bottle or packet, whatever it was. If you want, if you had guests visiting on a particular day and you wanted to make extra coffee or tea or whatever, uh, you didn't <laughs> have enough milk going around, and milk was not available from shops. It had you had to go in the morning and buy it. There was an afternoon supply, but it was very limited. And oftentimes, the milk used to be reserved for those who had those cards. So we used to. In, in Tamil, milk is called pal. So we used to call it extra pal. So if you go, to, if you go to the, if you go to the shop and ask for extra pal, chances are you say, no, I don't have anything. 
you have one crate which was some extra supply and that's it uh, so the reason i'm giving the example is it was phenomenally supply constrained um, there were very few brands there were very few avenues for availability and so on so um, it was as much supply constrained as it was income constrained and demand constrained i think it's really post the 90s and i've been fortunate enough to see the before and after so that in itself is a great learning uh, of how the economy works when you don't have controls and when you have controls and so on and so forth so uh, you know it's a very different way so i mean going back to your question i think the frugality of it really started then and the frugality of it by the way continue through actually actually you will know it is what it is and it has always been what it has been it's a very very frugal place it's a very very it's a correct place when it comes to money the correctness of what it owes the money is there no matter how big a business you are running you can't spend a rupee extra without justifying why you do again that corporate discipline i think comes from that uh, that kind of a place it just teaches you to be very very respectful of uh, of money amazing so uh, coming back to your uh, first five years bootstrapped journey of plum so right. uh, how did you uh, how did you decide that this is the product you will start with how did the product get made how did it get sold uh, take me through that sure so skin care it was to to begin with so there was no doubt about that uh, the brand why why, why no doubt about skin care why skin care So again, uh, going back to the faces journey, it was all a lot of color cosmetics and makeup. Makeup is a highly impulse-driven category, whereas uh, incidentally now skincare has also become impulse-driven. But back then, skincare was a consideration-driven category, and uh, the loyalty in skincare, the thoughtfulness with which people approach the choice of skincare, uh, thankfully, was high and is still high, as opposed to being too impulse-driven. uh and there is a lot more of science and a lot more of let's say clinical testing efficacy um uh, real longer term difference you can make to people they like them a lot more when you make the good right product in skin care which is the reason why i when i was leaving here and i didn't want to compete with faces i still don't want to uh and i didn't want to do something just go straight up against and, and therefore they were not doing skin care at that point in time so it was a very natural a uh, comfortable let's say decision for me to take without being torn as if well, am i doing something wrong so, so you're essentially a, a, like a product like at hul you learned how to create good product uh, so which is why also you would have chosen a category where quality of product is supremely important right. yeah mm, got it and okay. you know i to this day i'm obsessed over it to this day the formulation team works directly with me the packaging team works like mm-hmm. uh to this day you know i tell them you please test on users and get feedback they don't go ahead till i give them a my feel on what the formulation is about you know i say you know i i probably not the best person to tell you that but they respect my views on the product uh, for good or for bad uh so you know that's that's what it did. and therefore plum if you really go and ask people what do we really do well i think the all, nine out of 10 people are going to tell you product and uh, that is sort of ingrained in the dna of what to do now i know that there's a lot of conversation around you know product is three well edge everybody goes to the same manufacturer thankfully we don't we have our own r and d and our own way of doing things and to me i always maintain that in anything whether whether you're building a mobile phone or a monitor or a watch or you know or a skin care product it is relatively easy to get up to a 90 because things are freely available out of 100 it is somewhat difficult to get to a 95 very difficult to get to a 99 very few make it to 99.9 and nobody makes it to 100 so we are in this journey with what we do not to get to the 90 we are in this journey to get from a 95 to 99 and beyond and the good part about beauty and personal care which is again one of the, one of the reasons why i like being here is consumers appreciate the difference between a 99 and a 95 they may not articulate it every single time they may not go to a shop and say give me that product with gives me 99 percent efficacy but in their mind when they make that complex decision of what to buy what not to buy what to stick with what not to stick with uh, the 99 starts to play a role in their mind 
okay interesting uh, so so that's really the the thing about uh, about product why skin care huh. okay so you and chose skin care uh, so i chose okay. skin care uh, and and uh, you know uh, i i i thought it would be relatively easy for me to find manufacturers uh, to make small batches and mind you this was 10 years back when smaller brands were frowned upon and i have been to manufacturer visits where they said do you have distribution how you sell any of those i'm like you know this is this a catch for me to or do i distribute if i don't have product so let me make product first and they said no no come to me when you have distribution there are others who didn't even have the reason to answer the phone so uh, it was a struggle it was a much bigger struggle than i thought it would be to get packaging to get manufacturing thankfully a few kind souls helped at that point in time believed as i always say it's very first and foremost is to believe in somebody and in something and a few people believed and uh, i'm happy to report that those who believed are still with us and we are among the largest uh, customers and uh, i'm grateful yeah. for those for those relationships i think for d2c brands possibly the first investor in the brand is actually the contract manufacturer but no longer i mean it used to be but now it has become very plug and play so you know i i routinely see people offering you know one piece minimum micro factory 500 pieces and what not 100 pieces and what not so the entry barrier is pretty much down to zero as close to zero as possible in the tc brands uh, but that is uh, with all due respect i don't know if what you get there is what you really want you're getting something to get you started i was able to get what i wanted in terms of the concept and coming to the concept of what i was creating i was not creating an indian brand with indian ethos i was always creating a global brand with global ethos and my inspiration has always been brands from the west uh, where there's a lot more thought a lot of good thought around product design around ingredients around efficacy around textures around sensory delight the values that the brand espouses and lives uh, which is a lot more wholesome a lot more fun and a lot more fulfilling to be part of than saying hey you know what i'm bugging this thing in the 50 gram jar and thrusting it into your face and pay me 350 rupees for it will be fair as it goes that's not uh, my idea of what plum should stand for it is always i began by saying we stand for goodness and product almost become incidental to this journey and that's what has been our uh, you know approach right from day one uh, so any coming back to the most have journey it was all about getting this product right and uh, the brand name was set uh, you were the hand. product guy like you made the formulations and yeah so at that time i didn't have a full fledged lab to be honest so i used to leverage whatever lab i could lay my hands on from here there wherever but i was in control of what was being produced uh, packaging was a big struggle but i gave some kind souls help along the way um, and i got out 15 sqs in a year's time i thought i'll do it in 6 months time it took me a year so the interesting that thing that happened also along this journey and maybe it's good that it took a year i had a lot of time while this back end was getting this thing i started researching i i'm no i'm a non social media guy I, i don't post on facebook twitter i'm very occasional on linkedin and uh, and i always been that and back then i knew i had no idea about facebook and instagram was still very new in india i'm talking 2013 14 and uh, i started discovering facebook as to what's going on there from a commercial point of view and i started writing blogs for the website guy right? so you know the technical content so i started writing blogs and i on a whim i started uh, advertising to get people into that blog and I, that's when i realized that there is something called digital marketing i had no idea about and she mm. wrote yeah amazing so i started with a 100 rupee budget i remember somewhere in that 2014 so let me just again please count reference 1000 rupees is too much 100 rupees is worth putting <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah so okay so you put a 100 rupees and see what happens and i was amazed that that is actually getting people to read the blog by spending money on facebook it sounds like a you know invention of the wheel or something but that is how much of a unique moment for me it was and i had no idea this stuff was happening i was a very very offline 
detail kind of a guy. Uh, and so for me, I just I just started delving deeper and deeper into it. Then I realized it's probably possible to build a small business basis just advertising online and not doing anything in retail whatsoever. And then I discovered Shopify. Again, Shopify itself was a startup in India at that point in time. And uh, I figured out ways to, I, I mean, would you being my way to glory in terms of learning how to any of, to any of these things. So uh, set up Shopify, set up this, set up that. And, you know, in July 2014, I had a running business with no customers, but it has a business ready to fire. And on 14th July 2014, if I remember the date correctly, uh, and it was definitely July, I can remember the 13th or 14th, we got our first order from a customer who clicked on uh, This was and, on your Shopify site. On a, so we had nothing else at that time. In fact, I, yeah. I had nobody else. I was alone at that point in time. So wow. everything else. So I remember it was the evening, 5 ish PM, and uh, I notification came to my order received, and that is the that that day we celebrate as Plum's birthday to this day. Wow, so, amazing. July of every year is Plum's birthday. And uh, all going well in 2024, July, we'll celebrate our 10th birthday. Mm, amazing. Uh, so that's how the first sale happened. It's another interesting story that I never got paid for that sale. Uh, oh, it because... was a cash on delivery. <laughs> yeah, it was a cash on delivery order. And my COD contract was still being... Signed. Under the name of delivery. Delivery itself was a startup there. And I like delivery because they never once told me that you are a guy operating out of a two-room apartment. But I will not come and therefore I will not come to pick up your order. Right? They used to religiously show up at 5 p.m. every day. Even if it was one box I was giving them to ship, you should do it with all respect. Right? So that is how at the other time my COD contract with delivery was not signed. So I wrote to the customer saying, you know, uh, I don't have a COD arrangement yet. So here's my account numbers. There was no UPI team and all back then. So here's my account number. So if you uh, feel like, please send me the money. And the money hasn't come yet. So that's the interesting story of our first. <laughs> 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 okay, amazing. Amazing. Uh, okay. So, uh, so what kind there of... on it was, you know, just building, 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 uh, mm. extrapolating. <clears throat> Essentially, like Sorry. Facebook ads own website, uh, that was it? Or did you also start that was selling it. So, on yeah. party, Amazon? So online, we started selling about... And that's also the coincidentally the time when Amazon was just about a year old in India. Nike was two, three years old and looking to onboard more brands. Flipkart similar, Purple similar. So a lot of these marketplaces actually called us onto their platform. That was a brand scarcity. Wow. Amazing. Mm. Right. Mm. So it was still a supply constraint <clears throat> market. Yes, on the duty and personal care side, yes. Mm. Um, and the first Amazon order, I was seller. I had to give it to an Amazon, and it was a it was an order of some four or five boxes. So, I mean, I was just two of us at that time in that company by then, and I had to go deliver this order <clears throat> about thirty kilometers from here. And he said, uh, "You have to come and deliver this." It was a PO for me. It was my first PO. And uh, bulk purchase you, orders, four five yeah. boxes of yeah, uh, first four four five boxes of uh, goods to be delivered at the big moment for me. It was October twenty fourteen. I remember I put it put it in the boot of my car. I drove it to that place. He said, uh, "You know, it's on first floor. I don't have people to bring it up. You have to bring those boxes up. I have absolutely no problem." So I lifted up four five boxes and took it up the stairs and delivered it. Got the rubber stamp that goods delivered, and I was hopeful I'll get paid in a month's time. And that's how the Amazon business started for us. Wow, amazing! So you, you was, chose to wow, go for right? the, the the fulfilled by Amazon model, where Amazon would buy it from oh, you. No, and it was stock a seller it model. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it was an FBA. So it was uh, the seller on the platform. It will be sold by that seller. So the seller is buying goods from me, and he will pay me after a month. Okay, like a cloud tail or somebody bought. Like a cloud the... tail, correct? But it was okay. a was a smaller. Seller goes, who Amazon and onboard at the bottom. Cloud till came much later. <clears throat> okay, 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 got it. Okay. And then we started FBA and FBF and all that guys. So, well, what is uh, the difference between FBA and where you you are selling directly and where you are going through another seller? Uh, technically, or 
in terms of implications? Uh, I mean, in in every sense, uh, I'm not aware of okay. the difference between okay. these so, three models. Market, I mean, okay. fundamentally, Amazon, take, take Amazon, Flipkart also operates the same way. Uh, many others operate the same way. Amazon is a marketplace in, as per Indian law. Amazon is a place where buyers and sellers meet. Uh, as per Indian law, which is getting stricter and stricter in the respect, a marketplace has no role in the transaction between buyer and seller other than getting them to meet at that marketplace. So Amazon just operates the place where people come and meet. Therefore, Amazon needs to have a seller. Amazon needs to have a buyer. The buyer is common people who buy on Amazon. Uh, the seller can be two things. The seller can be the brand itself or the seller can be a reseller who buys from the brand and sells on Amazon. So which is what Cloudtail used to it's be. So Cloudtail. So Cloudtail essentially is a seller on Amazon. So was the guy I delivered these four boxes to. Um, and when you do that, what you are doing is you are sending goods to their warehouse and it is up to them to stock it in the uh, in Amazon terminology, replicate it into Amazon's warehouses. So when you order, let's say, from a Kolkata, it comes from the nearest to you. If you order from a Delhi, it comes from the nearest uh, fulfillment center to you. That's why Amazon is able to do same day, next day, two days and whatnot. Because they are replicating that inventory across all their warehouses. <clears throat> when you are when you are a seller yourself, you are you are keeping your inventory. That inventory is still technically on your books, sitting at various Amazon warehouses. They become your places of business. So you are conducting business from those warehouses virtually on the marketplace called Amazon. And so you your goods move when somebody places an order on. Amazon. In the case of wholesale, you are, I mean, the, the previous model, you are sending them in bulk and you're getting paid for it. Okay. That's and, essentially the difference. And what is fulfilled by Amazon? Fulfilled by Amazon is when you are the so seller. Fulfilled but... by Amazon is, yeah, fulfilled by Amazon is the second part where I, the brand is the seller typically. It could be anybody being the seller, not necessarily the brand, but Amazon is fulfilling the order, meaning they are picking it from the slot in the warehouse, putting it in a box and sending it. The third model is where the order comes to me. I am sitting in my office. I pack the order. Amazon sends somebody, a courier, I up with some other agency. That fellow comes in the evening, picks up and delivers. That is seller fulfilled. The order is being fulfilled by the seller. Whereas in an FBA, Amazon is fulfilling the order because it's happening in Amazon's own warehouses, DCs as they're called. Hmm. And uh, you, if you want volume at Amazon, you need to do FBA, right? Because uh, Amazon gives preference on yeah. listings, and like if you are a Prime subscriber, yeah. you will mm -hmm. get that Correct. Prime delivery only yes. when the brand has signed up for FBA. Even even consumer preference wise, I've seen people check the Prime box. Uh, or uh, next-day delivery box or FBA box to uh, select brands with, where Amazon is fulfilling. Also, I think Amazon's own capabilities for same-day and next-day deliveries are now very, very high. And uh, we've it's clearly unparalleled. seen a preference. Yeah, it's, it is. Uh, definitely is unparalleled. And we've clearly seen a consumer preference for faster deliveries. And now I think the quick covers guys have taken it to another level, but uh, even otherwise, if you've seen a consumer preference for faster deliveries and that makes a meaningful impact on your uh, on your offtakes right okay okay uh, so uh, by 2018 is when uh, unilever invested right so what was right. your scale by then what kind of revenue were you doing annual revenue i think we were doing about 12 or 10 ish crores a year which is about a couple of million dollars and uh, how much of this was through Marketplace, how much through your own website? And this would all be online, right, at that stage? At that time, it was largely, we had just started detail in 2017. So okay. it was very small. Uh, at that time, most of it was through Marketplace. Our own website was also very small, 10-ish mm -hmm. percent of it. And uh, I've always been, in a sense, agnostic to channel. Uh, I'm a brand purist and a product purist. And therefore, for me, uh, when you are in the build out phase and you are not really optimizing for the last penny on the channel margin and whatnot, it's important to be present where the customer is present uh, and what the customer, where the customer prefers buying you 
is the, what's more important is to solve for that she prefers to buy you when there are a hundred other choices available. And I would much rather solve for that problem than for trying to optimize on where I should be having. Okay. Okay. Got it. Uh, so once the Unilever investment came in, uh, how did the trajectory change? And, so it didn't change uh, much. Uh, uh, before that, uh, the question is, why did you choose to raise funds when you had bootstrapped for five years, you had a profitable yeah. business? Yeah. So great question. And uh, I, 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 I debated this question in my head a lot back then. And uh, I must thank my mentor for that one conversation that we had in Jan 2018. And uh, I said, Vicky, I'm just not able to decide whether I should raise money or not raise money, because there are pros and cons. I've been on the other side. I know what private equity and venture capital sort of is. Um, I'm not sure if I want to do that. And, you know, I, and I, you know, even today, if you see a lot of high quality European businesses are family owned. I mean, they don't call it bootstrap because they're very old businesses, but they are family owned and, you know, they, they're very peaceful about it actually. Uh, in a manner of speaking, and they are proud about it, and uh, and there's nothing wrong with one or the other. It's just that it's important to acknowledge that various kinds of models exist. Unfortunately, in India, I think fueled by the way our news flow happens in this country, it's an all or nothing kind of a narrative that gets built. It's either this or that. Only this is good, and everyone's running in a certain direction. And all the hype and hoopla and all of that is created. Massive FOMO starts happening. You know, I, I mean, I, I just wish we didn't have these cycles in this country of people going crazy on things. And that we were able to be a little more nuanced and a little more subtle about some of these things. There's too much noise actually in this country. Of course, it's not just when it comes to startups, it's about practically everything. Uh, I just wish, uh, one, if I had one wish for this country, I wish it was a little more nuanced. Anyway, so. Coming back to this debate on should I be funded, not be funded, I was fairly clear you should not be funded, but I used to have back to that. By the time I had a team of, I think, about 10 people, and they used to come and say, hey, this is getting funded, that is getting funded, why are we not getting funded? I used to tell them that, you know, this is what the funded looks like and whatnot. And perhaps I was also too biased on one side of not getting funded, but I had seen the joy of being completely bootstrapped. But what you forget when you are doing that, is A, are you really realizing the potential of what your business is when you're constraining capital flow through? I mean, although we were profitable, we were not stinking rich profitable. Therefore, it was not like a whole lot of capital was being redeployed into the growth. You were getting by. Point number one. Point number two, you are probably not solving for the future. You are solving for the present. And sitting in 2018, five, five and a half years back, if we could not have predicted what we are seeing in the industry today. But somehow, I think my mentor had the vision to do it, which is why he's still my mentor has always been my mentor. He was able to see that this industry is going to explode in its potential as well as therefore the competition that you get from all, all shapes and sizes and forms. And more and more closer of home in terms of how we work, he said, you have built something. And by the time we had loyal customers, a lot of customer love and so that is the way we were able to sustain. And he said, you have built something which is very powerful. Uh, think of it as a nucleus with a lot of energy in it. Uh, I'm not asking you to splinter it apart and release nuclear energy, but if you just release a little bit of energy from that, you can sort of go far. Uh, and don't do it all suddenly and don't go for all or nothing style, but do it properly with the right level of inputs on uh, on capital. Right? Um, and that's when I opened up to the idea of actually raising capital and, and looking at capital not as an end in itself. Hey, I'm announcing on LinkedIn that I got this valuation on this uh, money, but more like I am building a business in as much as people as an input my time is an input, capital is an input. And therefore, I have got access to an input to building the business. Uh, is the perspective that I got about five and a half years back. I'm grateful for that perspective. To this day, I look at capital as an input uh, into the business rather than an end in itself that my valuation is so much and therefore 
uh, whatever. So uh, it's what you do with the money that's more important. Uh, so for me, you know, that's when the sort of things that I'm open to taking capital. As luck would have it, within a couple of months of this conversation happening, Unilever Ventures reached out. I was not even running a process or whatnot. Amazing. Reached out and they said, yeah. They reached out and said, we would love to take a look. And I said, why not? And yeah, I'm very comfortable with the place. And uh, you know, I was visiting the Unilever office after a very, very long time. So I was happy to be there. And then the diligence happened and then the company came. Mm, amazing. And uh, how did that capital help? What did you use it for? So, by, by the time this conversation happened and, uh, and, uh, and the money came, uh, what I had not realized was the working capital cycle that I was getting into. Mind you, we were still profitable, but I was not solving for working capital. We were growing fast. I had to pay a lot of vendors. And uh, retail was beginning to start, so the money was coming a little later than the online side. Uh, uh, you're saying offline so, retail was starting? Offline, yeah, retail was starting. And you were going to and, modern trade uh, only, I'm guessing? No, 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 we started with general trade, in fact. Oh, we started okay. with Health and Globe, which was a modern, modern trade chain. Uh, mm. And uh, other than that, we were also going to a lot of general trade. So... Uh, so a lot of the money was suddenly needed to pay vendors. In fact, uh, my finance guy at the time said, how did you time it so well that when the money came was exactly well? I said, I didn't time it well. And I not timed this well. It would be a deeper problem than, than you would imagine. So I think a, a, a lot of it was just getting the working capital fixed at that point in time. Again, we were not necessarily uh, uh, you know, burning. Uh, we were not... We were not pro- uh, making a loss, a p and loss at all at that point in time. So it was only for working capital initially. And we continued to be profitable throughout. It is only in the last two years when we have unleashed massive amount of experimentation around new categories, new channels, new ways of doing things that we have gone slightly negative. But as we speak, we are again in almost pulled back to where we were and we'll get even better from here, hopefully. And, uh, you know, the ethos of being frugal and being uh, you know, measured about money uh, still is there, no matter whether it is C, A, B or C. Because I think that's, I mean, fashionably speaking, that's almost the only way to do it. These uh, experiments uh, would have started once you raised your Series B of about 14 and a half yeah, million. Yeah, between B and C, yeah, B mm. and C, more, more C. Um, and now we know which ones are work, we are scaling those. And, you know, frankly, you can't grow unless you experiment, unless you take some kind of a risk. Starting out itself is a risk. Every new product is a risk. Every new store is a risk. Every new geography is a risk. Every new hire is a risk, in fact. So, unless and until you take these calls, you're not going to grow. And that is the you know, downside of being over bootstrapped. Because then what you're doing is you're choking the growth. This is exactly what my mentor said. He said, you are being frugal about it. You, are, you think you're doing a good job, but you realize that the potential that this thing, uh, thing has, you're probably choking its potential by constraining the flow of one of the most important resources that it needs, which is capital. Hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, what tell me about the experiments like you must have done some product category expansions and you must have done Correct. some channel expansions tell me about the product and category side first so we started off with skincare only uh, and then we added a kajal to it somewhere a couple of years down the line and that still is one of your top to use and does quite well um, but we pretty much remained in skin till 2018 <clears throat> right, skin and that one kajal happily chugging along. A lot of people started asking us for hair care. So, in late 2018, we launched hair care. Uh, now, clean formulations in skin is one thing, clean formulations in hair is another. Because the sensory expectations on skin are different and are more easily deliverable compared to the sensory expectations on hair. And secondly, hair is a lot more diverse and not more unforgiving when it comes to sensory 
vis-a-vis skin care. People will live with a little bit of discomfort on skin care, provided they're not doing good for them. With hair, they don't. And so when we launched 2018, we were launching the cleanest of formulations possible. But sensorially, not there. Uh, wh- um, what what do you mean sensorially? Does it mean that so the lather example, would not come? Or? Partly, yes. So there is the, the sensorial can be broken into pre-use, in-use and post-use. And in fact, in the case of hair care, wet hair and dry hair. Post-use. So pre-use, it's how the formulation flows out of the bottle. In use, is it lathering? Is it smelling nice? Wet hair, combing, is it easy? Is it difficult? Uh, dry hair, does your hair feel soft, smooth, less frizzy? Uh, does the scalp feel dry and so on? Right. Now, and it's a combination of when customers evaluate your product, it's a combination of these things. Typically, they don't disaggregate in this fashion. Right? So when you're doing uh, a clean formulation in hair, uh, chances are you are compromising in one of these parameters, one or more of these parameters, compared to what people are used to. Otherwise, it's a little bit like eating healthy food. You you know you're doing the right thing, but you're not necessarily enjoying the process. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's what we real that was we learned. To give an example of the experiments we've been doing. Uh, that's what we learned with hair care. Not that it, these things didn't scale, but uh, they kept telling us that we need to do one better, one better, one better. So fast forward to now, we now have, I think, a week three of our hair care in operation. And that is, I think, finally the right balance of being sensorially acceptable or delightful <clears throat> and using the formulation that we are happy putting on. Uh, so that's the balance that I think I think we are still about three fourths of the way there, and we'll get there. I'm very sure. But at least we are directionally very much there, uh, and and it's doing quite well as a category also now compared to what it was. A contribution is now into double digits, which it never was. <clears throat> Similarly with Bath and Body, Plum always had Bath and Body, but it was sort of part of skin. So we launched a Shardil, we launched a hand cream when we launched in 2014, 15. It used to be called Plum itself. And uh, because some people still remember the products from that time. Uh, and But then we said, maybe body needs a very different trajectory from skin. And I think in hindsight, the right call to take. Uh, so we branched off into a sub-brand called Body Loving uh, in Plum. <coughs> it's called Plum Body Loving. Now, what doing a sub-brand in, in, uh, in body has allowed us to do is liberated it from the if you can call it constraints of being a skincare brand, uh, which is slightly being a little more serious about things, a little bit more benefit driven, a little more scientific. That's what skincare brands are, whereas bath and body brands are a lot more outgoing, a lot more here and now, hedonistic, pun driven, pun driven sometimes, and you know, that kind of stuff. And the interesting thing is within this. Within this place that we have, uh, all of us like both sides. So it's not as if we are the serious scientific type. It's not as if we don't pun the hell out of you know everything that we see and sort of crack jokes. And Plum therefore also has that personality even in skincare. But in body, we thought we needed to go a step further. <clears throat> so that's when Body Loving was born uh, three, three and a half years back during the first wave of COVID, I remember. And uh, then that has got its own now trajectory. So that's another successful experiment that we've been running. And in fact, it is the XKU complexity within body now is paralleling that of skincare. Because by definition, it is a more experienced one category. People want a variety all the time. The last one that we are currently doing is actually not necessarily the last one. We always had a Kajal, as I mentioned, but a lot of people used to come back to us and say, you make good skincare. Why don't you make good lipsticks for us? Largely, it was a question around lipstick. And because they knew we could make a good Kajal, they said, why don't you make a good lipstick? And we held off for the longest time because coming again from our faces, DNA, I know how different these categories are. And so we held off till we could <clears throat> justify its presence. And skincare itself was meaningfully big enough to support something like this. 
And so finally, in 2021, we took the plunge into the world of makeup. But I think now, makeup is a very strong contributor to plum. And uh, it, in fact, the way we are looking at makeup is to add to the brand rather than to only take from the brand. And that architecting is still WIP, but I think we are very close to the final answer there. So, uh, so makeup that's... would not be a sub brand, you're saying? Makeup would be under the plum. Makeup is under plum. So, skin, hair, and makeup okay. is under plum. Hmm. Because there are lots of overlap. For example, a foundation that you apply on face, what do you call it? Is it skincare or is it makeup? Or is it makeup, skincare infused, makeup for skincare with makeup, for a lip balm with tint on it, right? Uh, it technically sits under skincare category for us, but a tinted lip balm with as much color as it's about care. Um, and most of the, uh, you know, products that we make have care in them, even in color. And therefore for us, you can't take the care element away from, uh, you know, plum. And uh, whereas in body, it's, even though you may use moisturizers and whatnot, body lotions and body butters, right? It's very basic. Um, and it's largely a sensory driven category. That is the way we see it. And therefore, we have chosen to. Again, there are no right or wrong answers here. It's just the way we have to architect. But it's important that people see the brand as a brand and not as a collection of products. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what, tell, tell me about the channel side. What all experiments have you done there in terms of how you distribute, how you sell? Quite a few. So online has always been, it is still our largest, larger channel. Uh, what percentage is online? 60% is online still. Okay. Uh, uh, lots of experiment around D2C. D2C has scaled quite a bit from the times that we were uh, bootstrapped. And... Uh, a lot of investment into technology, user interface, fulfillment capabilities, uh, customer delight and so on, which continue to happen. We are very fond of that channel, perhaps because we were born with that channel. And so, I mean, leave the fondness aside, I think it's also a very uh, important channel from a customer proximity point of view. It is the purest brand experience you will get. Uh, online. That's the way we see that channel. So that there's been lots of experimentation around that. Similarly, in the offline bit, we have experimented with small trade, with having advisor-led outlets, sometimes two advisors in an outlet, outlet sometimes not having an advisor in an outlet, going so into... This would be like a shop and shop. So when you're shop. saying you'll place an yeah. advisor in a shopper stop or right. uh, one of such yeah, stores. Okay. So modern trade, general trade, small towns, big towns, old outlets also, we have about 32 now exclusive outlets. Wow. Which which are the purest brand experience offline that you'll see. Did they are like um, pop-up stores or like no, no, how big are they? Stores. Okay. They're about 400 square feet. Okay. Uh, long-term lease. Um, including a few at airports that we've been doing. So, quite a bit of work around the channel side. There again, winners emerging uh, and, and things are getting scaled as we speak. Uh, and wherever they are, there are things to be fixed, those are getting fixed to make them even better. Uh, what That's are the winners in, who are emerging in offline? So offline, pretty much all of them, uh, but I mean, we are not discontinuing any of these, but uh, some need to be optimized. For example, own stores, it's only a two-year-old experiment. So there's a lot of optimization around the customer experience, the economics of how it is run, uh, the, the, the technology, in fact, it runs it. One thing you realize is you can't be doing offline stores. and Actually, you can't be offline in an offline store. So you have to be connected and have the same customer view across some of this sounds easy to say, but very difficult to execute. Uh, so those are the improvements that we are doing to make sure that they are one better than where they are today. Uh, but which is your most profitable channel? Most profitable? Offline. Yeah, offline. Offline? Uh, at the moment, it is our uh, assisted outlets. Okay. 
because oh, I think it's a function of the productivity we are able to get. And that also has gone through a, a series of inputs, refinements and uh, uh, improvements. So, I mean, it wasn't this before. So there's a lot of work that continues to happen to make them what they are. Uh, how did you make it? Uh, how did you improve it? Like, in what? Like, was it like you introduced a training module for the advisors, yeah. or like, what did you do to fix this and make it your? I think at various most... levels, various levels. One is at the retailer level itself. Which retailer are you? Where where are you? Which city? Is that a city where we have organic brand traction? Uh, is there a city where enough of that clientele exists that? likes to use our kind of brand. Um, are we getting the right person to man the store? Is she being trained well, as you said? Is she being incentivized properly? Uh, is the stock supply happening properly? Some of them is just hardcore operation. I mean, sometimes you go there, you hear the most operational of things that I placed an order three weeks ago and stuff still doesn't come. The shelf is empty, your person standing there willing to sell but having nothing to sell. Uh, is the stock turnover adequate? Is the retailer happy with you? Uh, is a distributor servicing properly? Is he being serviced properly? Um, are the promotions and offers being rolled out clearly? Are we listening to what the customer has to say in terms of the pack sizes that they want and therefore introducing those when, when we need? There are, there's a very long list of things that need to be solved for, even for a simple outlet that exists in some town. And it's and being the diverse place that India is, uh, you cannot scale by just extrapolating on an Excel sheet. Every district literally needs to be solved for. And to do all of this, you need the right field force and the right empowered field force, which sees all of this and uh, you know takes the does the right thing in the market. So I hope I didn't make it sound too complicated, but that is that is what it is. How big is your field force? About 140 at the moment. Wow. Not okay. including Quite. the beauty advisors. Yeah. A beauty advisor are also on payroll. They are on third party payroll. Like third party, but, okay. Uh, yeah. hmm. Okay. So, uh, help me understand what is the org chart of Plum like? You know, how many people in what kind of function and uh, how you think about managing the company through the org chart as a tool? Yeah, as you all over a period of time. Uh, when we raised our second round, it was a very funny org chart of 15 people reporting to me and the rest of the organization reporting to them. And I think we are about 80 people in all in HO at that point, and I think 70, 50, 60 people in the field. Uh, and therefore, it was basically a three tier organization uh, when Series B happened. Now, I think we are one, two, three, four, a five tier organization. Still not very, very tiered. And I hate tiers and hierarchies actually. Uh, and I prefer to keep it. The five itself is pushing it for me. And uh, the way it is, it's currently is, is the channels are separated into offline and online because they are almost mutually exclusive. Uh, and then there is a marketing function which at the moment reports directly to me. There's a brand part of it and there is a categories part of it, the skin and all that I spoke about. So these guys solve for everything from brand experience to product to uh, packaging and whatnot. Then there's a technical side, which is the R and D, the formulation side and the packaging side, which again reports to me. There's a finance side, which goes to our CFO. There's a supply chain side, which takes care of all the way from planning, procurement, manufacturing, uh, warehousing, logistics, which reports to the uh, head of supply chain. And that's that's how we are we are structured. And the HR as a function is quite small for us, uh, but very meaningful and efficient in what we do. And, uh, uh, what about I, technology? I, I so, uh, good question. We don't have a tech team at all. And it's a conscious choice. It's not by default. It's almost by design. We have also partners for technology. But we don't have an in-house tech team. It was one of the few 
startups out there and just don't have a tech team. So I just find the tech market in India, talent market in India. I can't, none of us actually have the uh, courage, if I can call it that, to uh, be participants in that market. Neither do I think more strategically that tech is the, and when I say tech, I'm not talking product tech, I'm talking Stick tech. Like UI, UX. Or... UI, you know, that kind of stuff. So, given that D2C is a 15% into the business right now, and maybe it will be 20, but not beyond. But even the 15, we are able to do a good job without a tech team. And for me to take a tech team on, manage their career aspirations and ambitions, and give them a growth path. Strategically, I don't see that in our organization. I can take supply chain people and give them a growth path. I can take finance people and give them a growth path. I can take sales people and give them a growth path, digital people, all of these guys, but not tech people because they are not a tech driven company. So, what they are going to end up being in this organization is a support function, you call it that. And I don't think tech folks in this country would be happy doing that. Right, or not, right, it's not sure. even justified. So why even try something that's not going to work? Or that you don't really need also at the moment. Okay, makes sense. Oh, what kind of investments have you done in tech? One is, of course, your own website. Uh, you would have invested in that, making the experience better. Uh, yeah. What else besides that? There's a lot of, uh, which I don't understand, honestly, a lot of tech around just wiring up the data flows in the organization. Uh, a lot of data flows in from our retail, from our marketplaces, and of course from the D to C channel. How do you and they are they come in various layers, shapes and forms, types, formats, uh, and it's still WIP. But I think they have done a good job of wiring all of this up and being able to dashboard it sensibly and uh, in a time bound fashion. Because the frequency of this data coming is also quite different and somewhat unpredictable at times, but very valiantly, the team has been uh, coding away to, we have a small team that does this. There are more data scientists than their coders. But they have been coding away to uh, make data available. And I think what I see today versus what I saw a year back in terms of data availability and the correctness and the timeliness of it and the insight driven uh, approach that we are having to data today is street side of where it was a year back and I can still see a lot more improvement possible but at least again there we are in the right trajectory. What does this data lead to? How does it help the business? It has to and it does lead to better decision making. For example, do I invest in a product anymore or is it demand, demand challenge territory where that format itself is beginning to lose favor with customers and therefore I'm probably fighting a losing battle deploying capital there. That's I think the biggest use of data has to be and is deciding where to allocate capital uh, for us. And that capital has to be allocated in places which drives growth. Uh, by allocating capital, you mean uh, marketing dollars? Like it could where be to spend that's your... a very, Yeah, so that's a very abstract statement I made. But what it really means is where do I invest marketing dollars which is the largest spend area in this, in this, in this business. Um, where do I deploy people? Where do I deploy my product development effort? Do I need to even do product development in that area? Or I'm just sort of taking, I'm getting into a point of diminishing marginal returns. Um, what do I plan for a couple of quarters from now basis what I saw last season in terms of inventory, in terms of marketing inputs. So most of the business planning and at some level strategy, strategy is too big a term to use here, but business planning uh, around marketing inputs, people inputs, uh, inventory inputs uh, goes towards, comes from data. Okay, understood. Um, okay, so uh, I want to ask you this, you know, slightly tough question. Uh, do you regret the bootstrapping journey? And the reason why I ask this Absolutely. is that it has taken you about 10 years to hit 400 CR. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And I'm sure you would be aware there are other D2C brands which have hit 400 CR in half the time. Uh, yeah, so even you don't. It, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. So, so, so I mean, you know, do you feel that uh, you could have scaled up higher if you had taken funds earlier? And no, so this is not a tough question at all. Uh, I have absolutely no. In fact, the, the part of the journey that I'm really, really proud of is that because you know, sorry, if it gets a little philosophical here. But what is it that one is truly, really trying to do? What is the race that we are in? This is not some nuclear arms race that I have four and you have 10 and I have 20 and you have 40. You have to really understand what is the purpose. You go back to where we started with what is the purpose of doing all of this? If my purpose was to scale and be the largest duty brand in this country, uh, sure, I'll be disappointed. But that has never been the purpose. My purpose has, has been is and will always be to build something that delights people and in that moment of delight they are reminded of this message of goodness. Right? So that's that's what uh, any of our brand is about and that's what our DNA is about. And I think that DNA was crafted sitting in that two-room flat uh, 10 years back. And I'm, I, we will not be what we are, we will not be what we will be without that formative DNA that was there. And that DNA is not about money. That DNA is not about scale. That DNA is about how you make people feel. And that, I think, is timeless in a manner of speaking. And, you know, going back to the same question, do you know if Nike is bigger than Adidas? I don't know. Do you think both are good brands? Yes. Do you think ASX is also a good brand? I also think ASX is a good brand. People have recommended ASX to me also. So, we have to point the scale question is useful for, I think, the investor community. And I have a lot of respect for them. I have also been part of the investor community. And I don't, for a minute, see that I'll take money and not deliver on scale. I will. And I'm. it's my responsibility. And I think we are doing well there to make sure my investors make money. But is numbers alone everything? No. I have, I have no regrets for... Anybody who's bigger than us, I wish everybody was. I have no doubt that we'll be bigger than what we are. But I also know that we probably won't be the biggest. And I also know very well that biggest is not necessarily the best. Uh, why Why do you feel biggest is not the best? And I mean, why are you? Why is being big not attractive to you? It's not. It's not attractive. But that's not my objective function. It is an outcome of what we do. You get to being bigger by doing better things. You don't necessarily do things just to get bigger. Is my view of life. Objective is not getting bigger. Objective was getting bigger at a time when I was below the minimums that my manufacturers would make. The day I crossed that limit, I need to stop worrying about that. I need to start worrying about the guy. I always tell my team this. Somebody is taking a 500 rupee note out of their wallet. When they have a hundred thousand million other users for that, and they are choosing to give it to you to buy something that you have made, they have no compulsion to do so. They are having a certain expectation from you. That is why they are parting with their hard-earned final rupee to buy something that you made. It is up to you to make sure that you absolutely delight them with what you give for that final rupees or whatever that money is, and get them to say, okay, here, take me another 500 rupees or 1000 rupees. Next time I'll tell my friend to put their 500 rupees also and buy something for you. Rather than, how do I milk maximum out of this 500 and find the next sucker who gives me another 500 rupees? So, to me, this journey has always been about creating that feeling in that fellow who gave me that 500 rupees. No, listen, I found something truly outstanding and amazing today that delivered a message in my mind, some corner of my mind, and I sort of go and spread that around. And if as a business we are able to live that purpose, I think it's extremely, extremely orders of magnitude more fulfilling than any number. Now, the good part is, and the sort of commercially, let's say, expedient part of all of this, is that as you do this, this goodness will spread, and as a result, you will scale. So that's what I mean by doing better things so that scale comes, not necessarily doing things only because I need a certain scale. Mm. It's not as if we don't chase growth. I'm one of the, I keep telling people that I may be the, one of the oldest people in the office today, but I'm also the most aggressive. So you should see me in sales meetings. I am not uh, talking purpose there. 
I am talking numbers there. Make no mistake. <laughs> right. But, right. Okay. But okay. that's not that's not the you know uh, that's not the beyond a be all and end all over here. How do you drill this DNA down the organization? So you are very clearly customer obsessed, as you told me. You were responding to a customer escalation just yeah. before we started recording, Correct. and uh, so I mean, customer is very primary in your mind. Uh, but, but how yeah. do you make the organization live and breathe this kind of customer obsession? It starts I minutes mean, end to end. Yeah. So it starts all the way from how we think of a product concept <clears throat> to what we say to how we design the product and we say design the product I don't necessarily only mean the formulation I mean the 360 <clears throat> degree of it including the packaging which also is an important part of delight and it's not only the artwork in the packaging it's the engineering if I may use the term of the packaging which I keep giving feedback about so I'll tell you a very simple example there's a tube that we give I don't have it in front of me there's a tube that we give in which you have to unscrew because in India everybody wants everything sealed because nobody trusts anything. So you have to unscrew the cap and you have to lift, you have to peel off a uh, heat seal. Now, it's a very simple thing that when you have to peel off something, you need a tab with which, which you can hold with your hand and then hold it to peel. Now, something happened in the tube making process. The tab got stuck to the thread of the screw inside. So I have to literally you I don't know, dig it out. You have to struggle and, to... Uh, and when you're it. doing it, the tab gets torn and they're not able to open. I don't know if anybody in this country even notices, as I said, this country is not a country for no ones, but you will have customers cursing you when they're trying to use that tube. Maybe they'll move on to other things they will need to curse in a minute's time, but at that time, they're definitely cursing you for giving them that tube. They may not hate you for it, but the next time they see your product in front and they see something else in front of them, they will say, but this guy gave me a lot of grief to open the tube. And people have actually told me that I stopped using because your tube was difficult to open in another, another context. I know this is real. And they will move to something else. Very, It's not as if they move to something else because they hate you. They just say, you know, let me just try something else now. Now, I should not be giving them that experience at all. Now, this got related to my packaging head the moment I saw it. I saw it completely out of context in some other thing I was trying to do and I said this is just not right that I'm giving something that is difficult to open in the first place they may have the tube manufacturer may have their own commercial whatever technical reason to do it but I mean I don't mind I mean I my customer doesn't deserve this so this gets relayed and it is these feedback loops that that are in operation here to this day I read every single review on the website to this day there's not a single review machinery that is unread in my inbox it's a religion for me to see. It's a religion for me to make sure that one star and two stars are responded to, escalated or solved. Sometimes customers leave a five star review by mistake when they have negative feedback to you. I read those also and make sure my team doesn't miss them. So they know I'm watching. There was an escalation that came yesterday about a refund that did not get processed for 20 days. I made sure a deep dive has been done on it. I am meeting the customer support team myself later in the afternoon. I have set up half an hour today. To understand why a refund should take 20 days in the day of UPI. It is just not right. Somewhere the process has failed. Somewhere you have not gone beyond my 9 to 5 job and ensured that somebody, again, that person took a 500 rupee note out of their power bill wallet to give it to you, thinking you will give them something. You decided not to give, cancel the order. The first thing you should do is return the money. It's 101. But when you're running the system, these things begin to fall off. And I am obsessed about making sure we don't forget that people are parting with their hard-earned money to buy stuff that we make. They're not duty-bound to do it. We are duty-bound to make sure that they get what they pay for. Or worst case, they get their money back. Amazing, amazing. So, this obsession, it's not, it's it's driven by action rather than by words. Yeah, absolutely. You have to I mean, live it. not perfect. Yeah. You have we're to not be perfect, an idol. I don't see any other way to do this. Absolutely, I don't yeah. see any other way to do this. Mm. I just don't see. In fact, we have eight ways of working in this organization. The very first one says customer view is the only view that matters. It's drilled into people's living. It's right. It's the biggest thing in front of me right now. I can see that in front of me. Customer view is the only view that matters. My view doesn't matter. Somebody else's view doesn't matter. 
I may think this is that's why I tell them don't come and test formulations with me anymore because my view doesn't matter. You have to ask people who have oily skin or who have dry skin or who have acne or whatnot. Test with them, get their view. Their view is what matters. And this, by continuous repetition, almost becomes second language to all of us. We're still on that journey, not there, but I'm very uh, kicked about doing it this way. Where do you see Plum, let's say, five to ten years down the line? What, what What's like your long-term vision for Plum? So our vision, as we put it on the walls of the office and I've been trying to live, is to touch a million lives every day. And every time they, we touch them, this message reaches them and the smile that goes, saying, I've been touched by something good today, let me sort of spread that good. So that's really a vision. So if I can... In a country of a billion people, deliver a billion and a half people actually deliver a billion experiences every day through whatever means. They may be using my lip balm, they may be using my face wash, they may see my creative somewhere and billboard and that puts a spine on my face, even if they're not using my product. But my vision is to really touch a billion lives every day and spread this message uh, through, through what we do. And I don't know how long it will take us to get there. Sometimes things surprise you or get earlier than what you think. But... A 10-year time frame is a reasonably good number to have in mind as you get on this journey. What kind of organization would you visualize Plum being? Like, like like a PNG or like a body shop or what, like 10 years down the line? More a body shop than a PNG. Well, PNG mm-hmm. is really a... Uh, any of these guys, for the matter, she said, oh, PNG, Estee Lauder. It's a house of brands. You do multiple things all the way from skin care, hair care to fragrances to this and that. We are, we are not a house of brands. We are maybe two, maximum three brands wedded by an ideology. Uh, and that ideology to us dominates more than scale to the discussion of a few minutes ago. Uh, it's not just scale that we are chasing. We are, we are trying to get even better at living this ideology and spreading this ideology of what goodness means. One thing I've realized through this journey is uh, the appeal that something like this has universally with people and it's almost subconscious at some level to people. Also what I've seen even through the sort of synthetic world of so sometimes synthetic world of social media is people are able to spot a lie from a truth very quickly very very quickly almost at a at the subconscious level and the posts that we write and put out from the heart always get more traction compared to those which are very engineered and so for me we are always going to be about that and that's what people like us about and that's what keeps the flywheel of the business running in terms of customer love and product and whatnot so and that i think is also what a body shop has been about that the customer who walks into that store and pays a lot of money, not 500, but a lot more than that, uh, believes in something that the brand stands for. They don't care how big or small the brand is. They just like the brand. And that's that's who we will be also. It will be something very, if, if all goes well, we will be something very special, very unique, very, very valuable. Not necessarily the biggest, perhaps. I don't know. That's not in my hand. As I said, that's not my object, objective function. Um, but definitely something that's very meaningful, something that's very authentic. And if you're able to get all, most or all of these adjectives delivered while getting to touching a billion lives in 10 years, I think that's an outcome that I would die for. And would you be an India-focused brand? I think so because the A, there is so much to do. The sixth of the world's population is here. Might as well focus here. Second is uh, per capita consumption and all that jazz. It's in the first page of any investor deck here. So uh, definitely room for growth. Thirdly, we understand this customer or we still try and understand this customer. Effort is always on. Relate to this customer. For me, uh, a foreign geography where I have a very vague impression of who it is. Even within India, a South Kerala is so different from a North Kerala. Forget about Kerala being different from the rest of South India, being different from the rest of India and so on. 
within south kerala the urban versus rural will be very different for me this is the nuance that creates value and i would struggle even in the day of ai to 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 get this nuance right even in a bangladesh forget about uh it's a kenya or brazil a neighboring country for us to get the nuance is difficult uh so for me the international is all about fulfilling demand and sort of being smart about creating or stimulating the right kind of demand in the right kind of places it's never about a world conquering amish